Hello listeners, this talk is in response to Adam Adams and he wrote the following to me. I think if you did a talk on tips for the individual on prepping, where to take white flight within one's country or internationally, it would give people a lot of hope and something very tangible to chew on. Thank you for that suggestion, Adam Adams. I'm actually still sitting on a question that you posed to me probably six months or so ago now uh, about my preferred system of governance. It's a very difficult topic. I've actually recorded that probably four or five times now. I uh, sort of have a crack at it approximately once a month and then I end up very dissatisfied with the uh, the outcome. It's It's a tough nut to crack that one so I'm still thinking about it hopefully I'll sort it out eventually I should say uh, with this topic though I, I am going to address it I actually recorded it the other day and it was really long and it, it became a really kind of sprawling um, talk that covered a lot of different points so I've decided to re-record it and split it into two separate talks so here we go I'm not going to talk about prepping in great detail in terms of uh, things like what you should buy and the kind of um, resources you should acquire and all of that sort of stuff. I don't really know that much. I, I know a tiny bit about prepping, but very little, and I haven't really practiced much of it myself. There is a lot of really good information on the internet about this including on YouTube, there are a number of channels where they have huge amounts of information about everything to do with prepping. Prepping, So I think it would be better to go and look at those kinds of channels if, if you're interested in uh, the, you know, what's having a first aid kit or what to, to buy in terms of a, a water filter or that kind of stuff. There are people who know all about that stuff. I don't really know about that stuff. So uh, if people are interested in that, they should seek another channel. Um, what I am going to do though is talk about white flight, some options for white flight. I'm going to do a little bit of an analysis on different places and also um, think about even, even within one's country uh, locations and that kind of thing. So in terms of international locations, I'll deal with that topic first. Uh, in terms of international locations, immediately I would eliminate Africa and the Middle East for, for pretty obvious reasons. I don't need to go into that. I would also strongly consider avoiding any area that's either deeply landlocked. So here I'm particularly thinking of Central Asia, including much of Russia, um, or very remote islands. So for instance, the Pacific. Uh, a lot of the islands in the Pacific, the, the small islands. Because in the short term, these places might be good if you were trying to avoid some sort of geopolitical shake-up. But they would be very bad in the long term. And by long term, I'm really talking about um, beyond your own lifetime, the lifetime or lifetimes of your descendants. Uh, because these places will probably always be backwaters. In the case of somewhere like Central Asia, it's just that that region is just so far away from coastlines, and that therefore restricts trade. I know there was once the Silk Road through there, but nevertheless, having access to water is is massively more efficient than um, than land trade. Uh, shipping is so much cheaper than and and more efficient than um, road or rail. So anywhere that's a very long way from a coastline is going to be a real backwater, and in the long term that's going to be bad. And and we we can see that by looking at history at those regions. There was a time when the nomadic people of Eurasia were quite a threat. But steadily, uh, with advancing technology, that advantage that they had was curtailed. And then, after that point, those those people became um, 
uncompetitive, really. So moving to a region like that would would just be very bad in the in the very long term. And of course, those kinds of regions, maybe not so much Russia, although we don't know what's going to happen to Russia's um, territory in the future, but but Central Asia or somewhere like that, or anywhere else that's really landlocked. Um, I, I don't mean somewhere like Central Europe, because that's actually still fairly close to the to the sea and so on. But somewhere like Central Asia, for instance, um, the people there, they just have very different cultures. Um, and you wouldn't fit in there, I think or your descendants wouldn't either, or they would end up becoming like those people. So, you know, those places are always going to be backwaters. Likewise with um, very remote islands, they're just never going to be big enough to sustain anything important, essentially, um, or anything big. So, again, your descendants in the long term would stagnate. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's part of why those places were essentially Stone Age when they were discovered by Europeans because no one else had traveled there and taken civilization there. And, and so they were backwaters. Um, so yeah, avoid, avoid areas that, that are sort of really remote. Um, also I would say eliminate most, if not all of Latin America. Latin America is very unstable politically and economically and pretty much always has been from the time it was settled predominantly by the Spanish but others also um, it's just been very unstable um, in the colonial period and then even after a lot of those countries got their independence in the 19th century in the first half of the 19th century uh, they immediately set upon each other and they've always been riddled with corruption and a very rigid kind of um, hierarchy and so on, such that most people lived in abject poverty and all of this sort of stuff. Some regions were, or countries were better than others, but generally speaking, Latin America has been a, bas a basket case from the get-go, and I don't think that it's going to get any better. Um, some countries had potential at, at one point or were doing okay, but I think a large part of the issue is demographic and in the long run that's going to be very bad. Um, I mean also in the short term, these places would probably not be very good in a crisis for, for a few reasons. Firstly, um, you would always be perceived as an outsider and therefore a target. At best, people would leave you alone and they, they wouldn't help you, uh, but you would be, it's likely that you would be perceived as a gringo and, and wealthy and so on and so forth, or just an outsider and, and therefore a target. And some of those places are, are pretty wild, actually. Some of the, the um, sort of guerrilla groups and so on that they've had there have been pretty wild and um, the mobs and um, crazy governments and so on. I don't think it would be a good place to be um, anywhere in Latin America in, the, in a crisis. And a lot of the countries in Latin America also have very high crime rates, uh, particularly violent crime. In the longer term, I think that a lot of their problems, the problems that I mentioned earlier about um, corruption and dysfunction and so on, I think a lot of these stem from um, genetic issues. Uh, I, I imagine that most people on the alt-right or neo-reaction or any of these sort of non-mainstream right-wing movements believe to a fair degree in HBD, human biodiversity, and therefore think that there are very real differences between populations and, and a lot of these differences are genetic. They're not just cultural, they're genetic. Um, and if you look at a lot of these places, uh, basically the more mestizo they are or Amerindian they are, the, the worse they are, essentially. If you look at the IQs, the average IQs in Latin American countries, most of them are pretty grim, actually. And so you're up against that. Um, I don't think that any of these countries will ever climb out of, of being grossly dysfunctional, simply because of the populaces in those places. And even um, the places that are whiter are still actually quite... Um, mixed. They'll say that they're not. A lot of people um, identify as being white, but they're not exactly. Um, 
So I think those places are always going to be basket cases and some of them will always be on the cusp of breaking through and never will. Um, and, and the other thing that in particular that you have to consider with this is that if you move to a location, uh, if you expatriate and then you have children there, even if your children are not mixed, the longer they're there, the, the more likely it is that they will interbreed with the locals. And so, so, you know, would you want your children basically marrying into low IQ dysfunctional populations? Because it, it probably would happen. Um, the likelihood of your your children sort of remaining as a kind of an intact um, ethnic minority is quite low, and they likely wouldn't marry into the sort of uh, more European elite in those countries uh, unless they somehow became very wealthy. But but one of the things about Latin America is that um, the class structure is actually quite rigid. And because there's a lot of corruption and dysfunction and so on, the the wealth is very entrenched. It's very There's low social mobility. It's very hard to move from poverty or even the middle class into the elite. Um, and those people, they marry amongst each other, and they have been doing so ever since they've been in the new world. And therefore, it's highly unlikely that your children would ever move into that part of the populace. And so in all likelihood, they would gradually be absorbed into this uh, sort of mestizo uh, dysfunctional mix. So, you know, do you want to go there? I actually looked into Chile probably about... Oh, a year and a half ago, something like that. I spent a month or two researching the place, all sorts of things, um, looking at um, expat, uh, an expat forum and um, just reading as much as I could, watching YouTube videos, you name it, about Chile. And the more I read or watched about Chile, the more I realized that it has very deep structural issues, many of them, I think, because of these genetic factors. And, you know, there's that saying, one swallow doesn't make a summer. Chile has been doing okay for a few decades now, but when you look at Latin America, you have to look at the, the entire history of Latin America. So a couple of decades out of several centuries um, does not necessarily make a trend. And the other thing, too, is that even if Chile were to be functional, you have to look at its neighbours, uh, one of which is Bolivia, which is a grossly dysfunctional country. Um, and actually, Bolivia and Chile have um, pretty sour relations going back to the late 19th century when uh, Chile fought a war against both um, Peru and Bolivia and took provinces off each of them, uh, such that at that up up until that point, Bolivia actually had a coastline, but they lost their coastline, and now they're landlocked, avoid landlocked countries, as I said before. Um, but you know, Chile, even if Chile is functional, you have to look at its um its neighbours, one of which is Bolivia, which is a grossly dysfunctional country, and that's one of the perennial problems with Latin America, that even if one country starts to claw its way out of, or, or appear to claw its way out of, um. Latin American problems, there's always the risk of contagion or just general sort of regional instability and so on and so forth looming over those countries. Um, so, you know, you have to think about that kind of thing. So the more I looked into Chile, the more I thought, ah, there, there are actually a lot of problems in Chile. And Chile is meant to be one of, one of the better countries in Latin America. Costa Rica is another one. But again, look at its location. It's, it's very close to some of the worst countries in Latin America. Uh, most of the Central American countries have absolutely insane homicide rates. Um, and they're, they're grossly, like really, really grossly dysfunctional countries. Uh, and so they're right on the doorstep of a country like Costa Rica as well. So, you know, these are all problems with, with Latin America. The more you look into it, because uh, Chile is one of those places, and, and Costa Rica as well, that, that um, Western expats sometimes move to, and they sometimes rave about the places and so on. Uh, but the more you investigate, the more you find that there are actually a lot of problems in those places. So 
I would probably put uh, Latin America off the table. I mean, another one is Uruguay, right? But And Uruguay is often touted as being reasonable. But look at its location. It's wedged in between um, Argentina and Brazil. Those two countries are you know, not exactly fantastic. Um, and I don't think they're really, you know, Argentina is a really sad state. Um, it's It's been in this sort of terminal decline for a century or thereabouts. Um, and Brazil is just grossly dysfunctional as a country. So there's tiny little Uruguay um, wedged in between those two. So, you know, this that's the problem with Latin America. So I would probably um, rule out Latin America, though, you know, possibly a couple of the countries if, if push really came to shove. But, you know, you'd be playing with fire, I think. So what about Asia? Well, Asia is a really big place. I mean, it, technically, Asia is um it stretches from the Bosphorus to uh, almost it's to to almost the island of New Guinea, um, Indonesia basically. So Asia is enormous. I, I'm I mean, as I said before, I would avoid the Middle East and so on. South Asia, I think, is um it's too many people and you know there's a lot of poverty and dysfunction and so on in South Asia. So I'm really talking about East Asia, perhaps Southeast Asia, some parts of Southeast Asia. I don't think they're as good, though. Um, but, you know, there are there are real pros and cons to living in Asia. I live in Asia. So, you know, there are things I really like about Taiwan, for instance, and that I think are very good about Taiwan. Um, it might not sound like it after my... Um, last talk, the one about the, the pirouetting poodle and the um, the monkey show. But um, there are very good things about East Asia. Of course, there are many things that are very bad also. What I will say, though, is that in the medium term, and by medium term, I'm really, I mean a decade or so, you know, one to two decades from now, East Asia is really going places, I think. I mean, not, you know, China's having some issues, but... China's not going to completely fall in a heap. Um, I think they're here to stay, and, and they're going to assume their rightful place on the world stage um, that they occupied historically. Um, and and they, you would seem to imagine they, they would or should because of their size in terms of land area and population and all of this sort of stuff and, and the intelligence of the people there. Um, I think Asia is going to be where... Uh, it's at economically. I think much of the West is really stagnating. I can't see anywhere else really getting its act together. Uh, a lot of Asia is really starting to go places. A few days ago, I watched uh, several talks by someone called Martin, Martin Jacques or Jack. I, I don't know how you pronounce his surname. It's spelled J-A-C-Q, uh, C, uh, uh, J-A-C-Q-U-E-S. Um, He's a British uh, professor, an expert on China, and he and he in 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 those talks he was talking about um, uh, economic figures and so on, and China, and to a lesser extent India and some other places, Indonesia, Vietnam, and so on, they are really moving onto the world scene, and I don't think that's going to change even even if China. Um, experiences a few problems with its economy. Um, I don't think that's going to change in the medium term and beyond. Asia is really going to be where it's at. I mean, there are billions of people in Asia. There are, there are more than 3 billion people just in um, uh, East and Southeast and Southern Asia. That, that sort of area is going to be hugely important to the world economy. So, you know, that's a real advantage. You could move there for that, um, whereas much of the West is going to be mined in stagnation and crisis, really deep crisis. I'm going to get to this, but, you know, possibly war, um, but certainly significant crisis, even, even aside from the prospect of war. Asia could possibly go that way, but I think Asia is really going to be where it's at. Um, and I would suggest that even if you don't end up moving to Asia, you should at least somehow try to cash in on this by doing trade with them um, or, or thinking about that. 
um, because that really is going to be where it's at. It, it would be like saying at the end of the 19th century or, or thereabouts that you, you were going to ignore the USA. That would have been folly in the coming decades of the 20th century if you had pursued that um, that approach. And, and actually, I really think that a lot of people in the West, particularly in Europe, to a lesser extent in the US and to a lesser extent still in uh, places like Canada, Australia and New Zealand be because of um, either their geographic locations or and or um, the fact that there are large numbers of Asians in some of those countries. Uh, but I really think that a lot of people in the West, particularly in Europe, are really living in denial about this. They're really clinging to the past days of empire and all of this sort of stuff when Europe actually mattered it doesn't, or it's going to matter so much less in the future than it does now. And I know that's a bit of pill to swallow, but um, if people don't come to terms with this in some manner, that Asia is growing, it's not going to disappear, it's not going to fall in a heap. Um, and j just by the sheer number of people here, um, it's going to be very, very important. If they don't come to terms with that, then they're really setting themselves up for mediocrity in the future. Um, and that's going to be a very bitter pill to swallow for Westerners. Um, that guy, Martin Jacques, or Jack, or whatever his name is, um, he, he discussed that in a couple of his talks. Um, Westerners haven't really had to th um, think of anyone else or th or imagine anyone else's perspective for at least a couple of centuries now, at least since the beginning of the 19th century, uh, yeah, 19th century, um, because they've been so dominant. But, but that's not going to be the case for that much longer. Um, I mean, for instance, uh, my wife's friend recently went to Italy for a few weeks and the Italians there refused to speak English to her. They expected her to speak Italian. Okay, that's fine in one sense if they want to preserve their culture and all of that sort of stuff. But it's very parochial and if they want tourism, then you know you have to accommodate tourists to some extent. And you know, who's gonna learn Italian? Who, even in Europe or the broader West, learns Italian, right? No one. No one learns Italian. Only Italians learn Italian. Um people are going to learn English and increasingly Mandarin and other Asian languages and if Europeans want to be very parochial about this then they're going to be second-class world citizens as a result um, that's that's really how it's going to be so you know I think Asia has potential if you want to ex expatriate to Asia economically there's a massive amount of potential here um, and some of these countries don't have anywhere near the red tape that many Western countries now do, and the the barriers to entry, the startup costs, all of these sorts of things for doing business are so much lower. It's really strange to say that because I remember as a kid growing up in the 1980s, the West was where it was at. I mean, Japan was sort of there, but the West was really where it was at, and we thought we were free and... Um, not just in terms of what we could say or do, but economically free and um, Western countries were the best places for business and all of this sort of stuff. And yet many of them are just mired in, in red tape, um, endless bureaucracy and so on. Uh, you know, it used to be the, the case that we would think of Asia or other parts of the world and think of these places as being inefficient, corrupt, all of this sort of stuff. In many cases, these places are overtaking the West on a lot of these um, these uh, metrics. So there are opportunities over here. Now, obviously, if you're a white nationalist, you're not really going to want to move to Asia. I get that. I understand that. Um, so you know, if if that's really important to you, well, you know, you're not going to end up in Asia um, because. It, it would be very difficult to remain um, some sort of intact minority within Asia. Eventually, your kids would interbreed. That's you know, The longer they were there, the more likely that would be to occur. Um, and eventually, your, your bloodline would end up being swallowed up, essentially. Um, 
even on the off chance that you somehow manage to remain an intact minority, you or your uh, descendants would probably always be treated differently. You'd never have the same rights, privileges or opportunities. You'd always be seen as separate. It would, be, it would all be um, fine during the good times, um, but you know, you would, there would still be restrictions upon you. Um, you know, Asia is not the West in this regard. Asia isn't stupid. Asia isn't shooting itself in the foot in the way that the West is, where anyone can literally turn up and five minutes later they're you know, Swedish right, or, or German or British or whatever after five minutes of being in the country. Um, Asia is not like that. They're not dumb in that regard. The West is really, really cutting its own throat in that regard. Other parts of the world aren't so stupid, including Asia. Um, and so you or your descendants would always be different. I mean, I'm different here. It, I'm married to a local, so that does sort of uh, mitigate some of those factors. But I'm still, I'm different. Sometimes that's good, but often only at a superficial level. If uh, You know, I mean, I couldn't run for, for office here or something like that. I mean, I could theoretically uh, become a citizen here. But people would, a lot of people would never see me as Taiwanese, as rightly so, because I'm not, and I never could be. Um, you know, people in the West used to actually think like this too. They don't anymore, um, but people in Asia still do. Many of them still do. And so you'd always be different. Your kids would always be different. And as a result, one of the things that, that tends to happen to a diaspora is that if for them to become somewhat successful middle class and successful in business or anything else they have to pursue certain strategies and because they have to pursue those strategies and because they're different they stick out that makes them targets when things aren't going well when when the economy is going well and the political landscape is all fine it's all smooth sailing, you know, the people will interact with you and it will be okay. But the minute something goes wrong, bang, that's when they're in trouble. And you can think of the obvious example of the Jews and you might say, well, you know, it's, it's more complicated than that, you know, it's, sometimes they bring these things up upon themselves and, and so on and so forth. Okay, if that example is too loaded, then perhaps think of an example like the Chinese. In Southeast Asia. So there are significant populations of Chinese who have been in various Southeast Asian nations often for centuries. Um, and this, some of them are still somewhat intact. Some of them have assimilated to one degree or another, such as in uh, Thailand or the Philippines or in uh, Vietnam. There's actually, um, interestingly, there are kind of, I can't remember the name of them, but there are Chinese Vietnamese and there are proper Vietnamese Vietnamese. Um, the Chinese Vietnamese, they speak Vietnamese and so on, but often in the West uh, and, and also within Vietnam, um, the successful Vietnamese that you meet are actually the Chinese Vietnamese. Um, so, you know, and this is the case even centuries later. Um, but in other places, they haven't really fully assimilated, you know, predominantly the, um, the Mohammedan nations, because they, they haven't converted to that religion and so on. Uh, so Malaysia and Indonesia. And periodically when something goes wrong in Indonesia, for instance, what happens, a big mob of Indonesians goes and beats the crap out of the Chinese there, or even kills them, burns their businesses, all of this stuff, right? Because they're jealous of them or they, they think that um, they're taking advantage of them or something like that. And so... The Chinese diaspora in these places, they, they're they always sort of one crisis away from being kicked out of the country or, or having their business burnt or something like that. For instance, another example is um, in Malaysia, there's actually affirmative action for Malays. The Malays are so useless compared to the Chinese there that they have to heavily discriminate against the Chinese in university admissions, for instance. And that's why there are actually a lot of Chinese Malaysians in other places such as Australia. They, they, they have left Malaysia. 
because there's so much discrimination against them because the local Malays are so dumb and the Chinese are so smart that um, you know they, they have to really handicap the Chinese there. So that's what tends to happen if you're a successful minority. Um, you know, from the Malay point of view or the Indonesian point of view, they would say, well, you know, the Chinese, um, they do all sorts of devious things, rah, 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 right? Um, they, there's probably similar rhetoric in many ways to the way Jews have been viewed in Europe. Now, undoubtedly, some of those things are true and some of them are not true. Um, but nevertheless, whenever something happens in Indonesia, what, you know, the first thing, the first response is go and burn down the Chinese quarters, businesses, right? That's always going to happen to you if you're a diaspora. So, you know, there's something to consider about um, moving to to Asia, even if you did manage to remain an intact minority and not over three or four generations be completely absorbed um, to within the general populace. You'd always be living on edge in in that sort of situation. So, you know, it's not it, it, it's problematic, as they say. Um, Asia does have some other problems also. Uh, much of it, the, the interesting or um, economically dynamic parts and so on, are extremely crowded and often becoming more so. Um, and there, you know, there are things like pollution and that kind of thing also. There's just a massive demand upon space and resources in, in ways that you can't really imagine unless you've been here. Um, it's insane. A place like Taipei is just off the charts compared to Australia, uh, you know, compared to Melbourne or Sydney even. Um, it's just full on everywhere you go. There are just a billion people, not a billion, but, you know, it seems like a billion everywhere you go. Unless you sort of really go out way, 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 way out into the mountains somewhere. Anywhere you go, a park, a shopping mall, the beach, you name it, there are going to be tons and tons of people there. Um, pretty much at all hours of the day, almost. Um, that's just how it is there. And, and every everything is in high demand. Now, of course, that means you can make a lot of money as well, because if you can service that demand... That's a, a great economic opportunity, but it does mean that everything, every little bit of land, every resource is in high demand. Um, and that's only going to increase as the Asian populations become more and more middle class as, their, um, as the GDP per capita and so on increases. There's only going to be more of a demand for those sorts of things. Um, you know, like probably 30 years ago, there wouldn't have been that many cars on the road in Taiwan. Just in the time that I've been here, I've noticed there are a lot more cars. People are becoming richer. And so, you know, there are all these old roads that aren't very wide. And in many cases, they can't make them any right, um, wider because they don't have the space. Um, and, and now there are massive numbers of cars everywhere. So the traffic can be really heavy and all of that sort of stuff. That's, that's a, definitely an issue in Asia. And you have to ask yourself, could you live amongst that? Um, some people can. I think, I think living in Asia is something that for Westerners is really only possible in one of two cir um, sets of circumstances. One is if you're quite young and it's sort of an adventure because it is very vibrant and exciting. And people I've met who have... Um, returned to the West have told me that it's really boring going back to the West because there is a lot of energy here uh, at night and all of that sort of stuff, night markets, and there's, just, there's a lot of stuff going on in, in many ways. I mean, I don't really enjoy a lot of that stuff, but you know, if you're young and, and you're into all of that sort of stuff, then it can be okay. Likewise, if you're on some sort of special expat package for a multinational corporation or something like that and they just throw money at you um so you so that you can live in a really huge nice apartment and have your own chauffeur and your kids can go to an international school and all of this stuff that can be cool too right i mean i can't speak from experience here um only only from what others have told me um but for other people i think you know it's that mouse utopia problem um, and a lot of Westerners really struggle with that. They they do get caught up in this. And I would venture to to guess that 
as low as the TFR in Taiwan is, I imagine it's actually even lower for Westerners here um, compared to the locals because it's uh, often the, the working conditions and the living conditions, the sort of sense of community, all of this sort of stuff, um, the transient nature of it, the fact that a lot of the Westerners here are young, all of these things make it very difficult to form a family and to have a family here. I wouldn't want to raise my kid in a major city in Taiwan. I think it would just be full on all the time. And I don't think that's really great. Um, and a lot of people here struggle with this. That's why the TFR in, in any East Asian country is very low. Uh, they struggle with this. They struggle to find, you know, to sort of figure out what they're doing. If you're someone who, who is not content to just um, consume, if you are looking for some raison d'etre um, or some sort of higher purpose in life, it can be very difficult to do that here. Um, so, you know, that's something to consider. The final thing I would say about Asia um, is that there is... There is a chance of war here. It's it's not an insignificant chance um, in this region, in well, multiple regions of Asia. Uh, China is a rising power, and rising powers they want respect, they want to be taken seriously, they want to be hegemonic, and they can be a little bit clumsy with that at some at some points. Ten years ago, China seemed to be doing pretty well in terms of international relations. But in the past few years, it's really rubbed a few of its neighbors the wrong way. And it, it actually has very long-standing um, border disputes and animosities and so on with all sorts of its neighbors. I believe there's actually, a, 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 I mean, it's kind of dormant, but still an unsettled border dispute with Russia. There's definitely one with India. They fought a war in 1962, which... Um, the, the Chinese absolutely handed the uh, Indians their backsides on a plate, um, and they took a little bit of territory. I mean, it, you know, sort of mountainous territory on the the, the um, borders, so it wasn't that important. But the, the Indians are still aware of this to this day, um, and China fought a uh, a brief war in the late 70s, or maybe it was 1980, something like that, with Vietnam. Um, and they've been rubbing most of their neighbours the wrong way for the past few years, either in the East China Sea or the South China Sea over who has what there. Um, and they're militarising islands and all, all of this sort of stuff. And the US is getting concerned about that because, you know, China's number two and they're trying to sort of, they want to become number one. And whoever is number one never wants to lose that position, of course. So there are growing tensions between those two. Um, who knows what will happen with all of this, but I'm not... I wouldn't rule out uh, war. I mean, China's relationship with Taiwan is very um, strained as well. Uh, you know, they've they've said that if Taiwan declares independence, then they'll invade. And there's uh, sort of a growing feeling of national identity and all of this sort of stuff in Taiwan. And then there are other other um, uh, sort of animosities or hostilities between various other countries in Asia. So we've got the two Koreas. Um, You've got India, Pakistan, and, and China sort of um, is kind of involved in both of those. So, you know, there are all these potential flashpoints in Asia. Who knows? Maybe nothing will happen. But if it did, um, you know, being in a really densely populated place, even if you didn't get bombed, the ensuing economic fallout and the fact that uh, supplies might be cut and all this sort of stuff, or there might be disease, all this kind of stuff could really make being in a very densely populated place, a very unpleasant experience. And so, you know, that's something to consider with, with Asia. And also on that, that issue of uh, disease, uh, if there's some sort of global pandemic, you know, it would spread like wildfire in a place like East Asia just because of the sheer number of people and the, um, the movement of those people on a daily basis. Um, I mean, that's not to say that the West would ne necessarily handle it so well. I mean, they didn't, when there was that whole Ebola scare in, what was that 2014? I think, um, you know, they there were a few cases in America. I think there was one in Spain as well. Um, you know, if that had really got that that had potential to really get out of control. Um, but nevertheless, Asia could be a real hotspot for that sort of thing for some sort of global pandemic. Um, so you know, these are all things to consider about Asia expatriation, white flight to Asia. 
I'm not ruling Asia out. I mean, I live in Asia, right? Um, it's it does have really good points. There are a lot of you know, it's really safe here, actually. You know, other than the fact that there are you know, a thousand nuclear missiles or whatever pointed at um, Taiwan. You know, other than that, you know, in some um, crazy driving and that sort of stuff, it's actually really safe. Um, you can wander around anywhere. You're not going to get beaten up or robbed or raped or you know, you're not going to get um, enriched uh, like you like you could very well in the U.S. Um, you know, literally here, no, you know, people, didn't, they didn't do nothing, you know, here. It, 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 really, they didn't do nothing. Um, so, you know, it's very safe and, as I said, there are economic opportunities and all sorts of other things too. Um, but I've just outlined a whole lot of disadvantages also. Um, but, you know, it, it's an option. Uh, you know, maybe someone like Singapore, if you could get into Singapore. Though, you know, it's a city-state and city-states can be kind of fragile. But there are places in Asia that are okay, but, you know, probably not for white nationalists, I guess. Uh, though not all of you are, and and I'm not. Um, Eastern Europe uh, is the next area I'd like to discuss. I think Eastern Europe could be a reasonable option. It could, it could be okay. Um, I don't think Eastern Europe is ever really likely to to go places economically. You know, it's 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 part of Europe, right? And it's always going to have that issue. Um, uh, it's going to have to deal with its neighbours, currency union, and all of these sorts of issues in Eastern Europe, and just being part of the EU. You know, um, the, there are a million and one uh, rules and regulations for everything. So. Economically, it's it's never going to go places. I think Asia will will outperform it greatly, and and of course a lot of Eastern European countries are very small and they have small populaces and so on. Um, I mean, I'm sort of excluding Russia here. Um, and Russia's a whole thing unto itself. It could be it could be okay, Russia. Um, but but nevertheless, Eastern Europe. It, it, I guess even including Russia, um, it, it's going to vary, but it's it's certainly not going to be an economic hotspot. Um, I think that Eastern Europe will likely avoid the worst elements of the coming civic and military, social, cultural, etc. crises, economic um, crises that we will see in Western Europe within the next, I don't know, 10, 20 at, at a very outside chance, but I think even less, uh, well under 10 years. Um, Eastern Europe will likely avoid the worst elements of all of that, though there'll be some fallout, you know, just because they're located in close proximity to, to those places. I mean, if Germany became a failed state, and it could very well become a failed state, uh, you know, the Poles, at the very least, would have to try to shut down that border um, and deal with at least the Germans, uh, you know, the, the ethnic Germans. Uh, but, you know, what if, what if Germany just became this failed kind of quasi- Sharia state, you know, with with we're sort of divided between the Germans and and all of the Mohammedans there, and so on and so forth. Um, the Poles would have to really sort of keep a lid on that, so it didn't spill over, so there weren't any kind of um, jihadi rape gangs that that you know ran over the border and snatched the girl out of you know Poz, Poznan or Turuna or something, right, and then ran back over the border. Um, so. You know that's that's always going to be a problem. The same with the Czech Republic, right? They they have a border with Germany, also. Um, you know, Prague has some incredibly beautiful women. Um, there'd be a, a, a that'd be prime real estate for um, jihadi um, uh, kidnapping runs. So, you know, they they would always have to deal with that that kind of fallout of of Western European nations potentially becoming failed states, or at least having sort of deep economic melees and all of this sort of stuff. Um, so I think that Eastern, you know, and I guess I should talk a little bit about Russia. Um, Russia has all sorts of extremes. You know, there are some very good things. There are some very bad things. It's very up in the air. Um, you know, its economy is really dependent upon a couple of sectors. There's gross corruption and dysfunction and so on in Russia. It's turning itself around in some regards, but there's still a lot of problems there, and they have all sorts of ethnic minorities there who, who could stir up trouble and so on and so forth. Russia could be an option, um, but you know, it, it would be a tough but perhaps rewarding option. Let me put it that way. Um, but nevertheless, I think that Eastern Europe 
would be a reasonable option. I don't think it would be terrible, but I think it's unlikely to ever be great. Um, uh, and as I said, you, you'd have to what, sort of worry about what would happen on your borders or, or other countries in close proximity. Um, now, the West, and, and by the West I mean Western Europe and the Anglosphere in the New World, uh, I'll give a, a quick overview of this. I might end up doing some other talks on, on some of these places in more detail at another date. So I know someone has actually requested that I do one on, the, um, on a potential breakup of the USA, um, which I'm still thinking about. Uh, but let me just give a, a brief overview of some of these places. So I actually do think that the US will likely split up. If it doesn't, it's pretty much going to be the Brazil of the North, if it doesn't um, split up into separate nations. Um, the coastal regions, most of the coast, not all of the coasts, I mean, Texas has a coast, for instance, but um, much of the East Coast and probably all of the West Coast um, would basically be full of poverty, corruption, crime, dysfunction, and so on and so forth. And all of that would be um, a direct function of their vibrancy and um, you know, diversity and all of this stuff. Uh, I don't think I'd want to be anywhere near those places. Um, and many of them, you know, California, for instance, Southern California, is uh, rapidly becoming non-white. It, it, I think it probably already is. I think Los Angeles is already more than 50% Latino. I, I can't remember exactly, but if it's not, it will be there very soon. Um, so, you know, if you're going to be an ethnic minority, then at least be an ethnic minority somewhere decent. I mean, you know, why live in LA if you could live in Singapore, right? Um, so, you know, that that's going to be a problem, living in those kinds of places. I think that middle America could be okay. I mean, you know, they, they, if and when the US starts to fall in a heap and break up, the the federal government won't let people just break away. That's not going to be a clean process. It's going to be messy. It's going to be um, violent. Um, so there's that to consider. And also, there'll be all sorts of other issues to do with debt and the economy, you know, because America has this enormous debt. Who's going to be saddled with that or in what proportion and all of that sort of stuff? Um, I think middle, middle America could be okay, though. I think, um, you know, as long as it's fairly white, and, and really it is in many regards, many of those states are, and there is still, although the the white population in the USA is falling, it's still about 60%. So to put that in perspective, that's 180 million people or more, uh, which is basically not far shy of the entire populations of um Germany, France, and the UK combined. So, you know, there's still, it's a, there's a lot there to work with. Um, I think, though, that aside from the aforementioned issues to do with some um, sort of the violent nature of the breakup and, and that kind of general um, chaos and so on, and also, um, you know, what to do about death and, you know, all of that sort of stuff, um, one of the m bigger problems that many people don't think about too much, probably with with um, the sort of the red states, the so-called flyover states, whatever, you know, the, the middle part of America off the coasts, is that a large amount of the USA is actually really landlocked. Um, and I think that if there were kind of a messy breakup where the um, the sort of coastal blue regions would, would um, only let those other regions go if they they could no longer control them. Um, I think they would be very vindictive towards those regions, and they would they would quite possibly say, "Well, you know, we're not going, going to give you free passage across our territory to the coastline. That's too bad for you." So, you know, where would they go? I mean, they could go down through the the Gulf of Mexico, perhaps. Maybe they could figure something out with um, with Canada. I don't know, but but nevertheless, that's a possibility that people need to consider that some of those areas could be landlocked. And land landlocked countries are at a significant disadvantage to those that don't have a coastline. Um, so, you know, that's something to consider. Um, I do think that one way or another, living standards and all of those kinds of things are going to decline 
at least in the medium term in the USA. Um, that's because of the rise of Asia and the economic focus of the world will move in that direction, either to the Western Pacific or the Indian Ocean. Um, and also because a lot of these trends to do with outsourcing jobs or um, the sort of obsolescence of, of jobs that people with lower IQs can do and that sort of stuff, along with automation <clears throat> pardon me, and so on and so forth, um, I think those trends are going to continue to a certain extent. Um, I think as much as I, I have some sort of sympathy towards uh, Donald Trump supporters and I, I like Donald Trump in some sense, I think people are engaging in a little bit of wishful thinking if they really believe that he's going to completely turn around the um, sort of deindustrialization of the USA. I think that's going to be a problem, an ongoing problem. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say about the USA. Now, Canada, Australia and New Zealand, I think these places are likely to be quite paused in the major cities. They already are. I um, mean, that's only going to get worse and those places are going to be uh, increasingly enriched and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, sort of avoid the big cities uh, you know like I don't like going to Melbourne now actually when I'm in Australia I really like being in the countryside um, and I think that's going to be the case in uh, Canada Australia and New Zealand in general um, I don't think it's likely that parts of well perhaps in Canada certainly more so than Australia or New Zealand I don't think there'll be any secessionist movements in Australia or New Zealand perhaps remotely um, it's it's possible. Well, you know, I don't know. Maybe the Quebecois would secede, um, but certainly in Australia and New Zealand, I don't think that would be the case. And I think a large part of that will also be because those countries will probably be a lot more functional than some other parts of the West and some other Anglosphere countries. Um, and I think the reason for that is uh, partly geographic and partly because of the populaces um, there. They are doing immigration and that's problematic in many ways, but because of their points-based systems, they're, they're bringing in a higher caliber immigrant. So the dysfunction is not going to overwhelm these countries. And there'll be a lot of connections with those uh, from those immigrants with Asia, for instance. So I think that um, actually Canada, Australia and New Zealand will probably do okay, not from a white nationalist point of view, but if, if you weren't coming at it from that angle, I think they'll do okay because to some extent they'll be absorbed into the orbit of China and Asia in general. And they will profit off that to some extent. Um, there'll be a relationship there that in a way that Western Europe or even the USA um, wouldn't have the same relationship. So, And there are good and bad points to that, obviously. But nevertheless, I think they will be a lot more functional. So you know, if you... If you're willing to sort of live in a town in the countryside, um, although there are issues with that, of course, because um, I made a talk a while ago for, I think it was Who Hearts of the Flat, about why more people don't live in the countryside in Australia. Um, you know, there are issues to do with um, uh, employment and education and social services and all of this sort of stuff. Um, but nevertheless, if you're willing to live in the countryside, in Australia or New Zealand, it could be quite nice if you avoided the really paused cities and the economy might have certain issues, but it would, I don't think it would be anywhere near as bad as um, Western Europe or even the USA. So, you know, some of these places could be an option, uh, you know, fleeing to New Zealand could be an option. Um, and New Zealand in particular, if there, if there is World War Three, New Zealand is probably the last place it's actually going to hit. I mean, that's actually one of the attractive things about Chile as well. Um, uh, did I mention uh, when I mentioned Chile before? That's something I neglected to mention. But um, you know, some of these places could avoid some of the fallout. Um, but to be honest, I think probably even fifty years, but but certainly one hundred years from now, Australia is not going to be a white country anymore. Probably the same with both New Zealand and Canada. Um, they're going to be. They're not going to be Asian. They're not going to be Western. There'll be something else. Um, but the, you know, if if you're really concerned about being a white nationalist, then I th think you should throw your lot in with Western Europe or the USA. 
um, and deal with their own particular sets of issues. Um, all right, so now I'd like to talk about uh, the UK and Western European nations. I think several of these nations have a very high chance of becoming failed states or semi-failed states embroiled in all sorts of um, conflict and crisis from um, military to economic to just general social, cultural, religious, all of that kind of stuff. Um, these places are grossly dysfunctional. They're really, they have fallen into an abyss of nihilism, many of these places. And um, but they're going to have to sort that out one way or another. Um, liberalism is going to come to an end in these places. Um, and I think that, I think if these things come to a head fairly soon, then they will, they'll win. If they don't, you know, if it takes decades for this to play out, it's not, it's not as clear cut. Um, or this could take, you know, the resolution could take decades. You know, if, if there are a few states that become fully failed states, other European states might very well have to get embroiled in wars sorting out Sweden, for instance, or sorting out Germany. Um, even if Western Europe manages to see its way out of all of this, I think in the long run, Europe is going to be greatly diminished. Um, it's not going to occupy the same role that it did for several centuries until fairly recently. Um, just because of its size, its location, its population size, all of that sort of stuff as well. Um, as I said, there are you know, 3 billion people just in uh, sort of from East Asia down through Southeast Asia and over to India. In that area, there are 3 billion people more, probably three and a half or something like that. Um, Europe also is very unfavorably located in terms of having um, two of the worst regions, or probably the two worst regions on the planet, in other words, the, the Middle East and Africa, right on its doorstep. And so those places are going to have their own issues um, to do with uh, population crises and um, internal discord and so on. And all of that is going to constantly wash up like an oil slick on on the shores of Europe. Um, so, you know, Europe is going to have these, all of these things kind of hampering it. Asia won't necessarily, as long as Asia can avoid uh, some sort of big war, and that's not a given, but nevertheless, as long as they can, um, then they won't have to deal with these sort of things constantly uh, dragging them down, holding them back and so on. Um, and Europeans are just going to have to sort out who they are and what they're on about because, you know, their six-week vacations or their whatever they do, their, their general nihilistic attitude towards life. Um, and there's, you know, I don't know, what do Europeans do, actually? What do they do? Um, they're completely engaged in hedonism and virtue signaling and all of this other nonsense. Um, they're going to have to sort all of that out, and that's not something you just sort out in a decade, um, and then you, and then bang you back, you know, you're back at number one, right? That's that's going to be a very long term um, situation to sort out, and it's likely that the standard of living across Europe is going to decline significantly within our lifetimes. Many of you who live in Europe now are going to be living in poverty by the end of your lifetimes. Um, and that's going to be widespread, um, regardless of whether you win the, the coming war or not. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a very personal decision, obviously, to, to leave, to go somewhere else. There are greener pastures. Uh, I'm not going to say you should go to greener pastures, whether, it, you know, Australia or Asia or wherever. Um, but there are greener pastures. But, of course, I understand people's deep connection to to their land and their history and their culture and all of this sort of stuff. But um, you're going to have to fight for that, and not just in the short to medium term in seeing off Mohammedanism. You're going to have to sort yourselves out. Um, and that's going to be that's going to be a multi-generational, probably even multi-century project. Um, you're not going to see the light at the end of the tunnel, to be honest. You're just going to have to walk along that tunnel 
having faith that eventually someone down the line, your great, 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 great grandchildren or whomever will see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, so, you know, I know there's a really grim picture I'm painting, um, but I think, I think that major Western European countries are going to have conflict. Um, you know, we can see where these demographics are going. We can see that many of these countries are grossly dysfunctional in terms of their economic situation and so on and so forth. Um, the problems are going to be so big and the countries in Europe are so small that even if you um, don't live in a country that directly experiences a crisis, you'll have a neighbour you know, 50 kilometres away, 100 kilometres away who will. And that, and you'll always have to worry about that spilling over into your country, or if you, or somewhere else in your, if you live in the countryside, I, I mean, you could flee to, I don't know, the Scottish Highlands or something, or you could flee to, I don't know, the, some remote part of France, uh, but you're still only uh, a short distance away from where the major action would be going down, um, and so I don't think you can really engage in white flight in Western Europe. Um, uh, because it's got, the, the, the problems are going to come and find you simply by virtue of the size and, um, and the interconnected nature or the, all, all of the borders and all of that sort of stuff in Europe. Um, I mean, I certainly think being in a major city in Western Europe uh, is a really bad idea in the next five to ten years, maybe even less. Um, I mean, look at that, that uh, the fact that London is now an occupied city and you know what's the what's the British population you know the truly British population of of London 40 percent or something within a decade that'll be under 20 percent because those people will be persecuted uh, their lives will be made miserable um, and so you know if you lived in London or Paris or wherever Melmo or any of these places and you were part of the minority or even a, a, a majority a slight majority or something like that um, and you had a significant population of Dindus and kebabs right there in your face um, you know it's going to be on and and there's a high likelihood that, that you could suffer as a result um, so I personally if, if I did live in a, a Western European country I would want to be away from the really big cities or any any city for that matter that had a very high foreign population because I think those places are going to be uh, ground zero for all of the crises that are coming um, yeah uh, I think that you know big cities do have certain positive points to them but I think these places are accumulating negative points much more quickly than they can um, deal with these negative points um, and certainly more quickly than they're accumulating positive points, if at all. So I think um, you know, avoiding, avoiding the worst kind of civic unravelling or, or social unravelling, dysgenics, uh, and, and even resource shortages. I mean, I wouldn't want to be in a huge city if it sort of became a war zone because the food would, would stop coming, the water would be cut off, the electricity would likely be cut off and so on and so forth. Um, you know, it could be pretty uncomfortable in one of those places. Um, of course, the, the issue in, in moving out to the countryside is always going to be an economic and financial issue. Um, you know, what, what would you do for work? Or more importantly, what would your children do for work? That kind of thing. Um, you know, that's a difficult question to answer. And I'm actually going to talk about some of this stuff um, in another talk, the sort of second half of this talk, because otherwise it's going to turn into this uh, sort of epic, uh, you know, probably at least an hour and a quarter, it could be longer this time, um, talk. So, so I'm sort of, I, I'll leave a lot of that stuff to the second talk. Um, but I would just caution that another thing, you need, another thing you need to consider if you are going to move to the countryside, wherever it is, whether it's Europe, Australia, America, wherever, um, is that, yeah, you have to think about work and that sort of stuff, what are the social services like, the educational, that sort of stuff. I mean, you could homeschool and so on, but, but you know, generally a lot of these places are under-resourced. 
Um, and also you have to think about the broader community because there are some places, I've lived in rural Victoria in Australia and the town in which I lived was a nice town um, and the school there was okay, the people there were friendly and all of that stuff. But I also worked for a time in a school in a neighboring town and that was really bad. There was a massive amount of social dysfunction in that town and the, the students at that school had all sorts of problems. So you have to think about if you're going to move into a community, a rural community, you know, what's it like? There's no point moving into an area that's depressed or depressing, um, be that economically or socially. You know, you don't want to move into a place where all the kids are huffing glue out of a plastic bag or something, right? Um, that's that's not good because, you know, your kids are probably going to huff glue out of a plastic bag as well. Um, but, yeah, certainly I think the cities are becoming quite untenable in many regards due to, di you know, diversity. They're, they're, they're being enriched. Um, and the pause, you know, all of the left-wing pause, um, long commutes even. A lot of people who, who work in the really big cities like um, London or New York, they can't afford to live in those places and they have very long commutes. Or um, the parts of those places are too unsafe and so they don't want to live around them, all of that sort of stuff. Um, so long commutes and, you know, that's a real drag. Um, and the cost of living, which I just mentioned. So, you know, I do think that the CCs are becoming very untenable. Um, unfortunately, that's where a lot of the decent jobs are, although I think a lot of those jobs are going to disappear or become harder to get for a lot of people. And I'm going to talk about some of those issues in the second half of this talk. So that's where I'm going to leave it here uh, because it's actually, yeah, it's already over now. Um, I, I must have rambled a lot in this one. Um, so the second part will be up so, you know, in a few days or whatever after this one. Um, as always, I hope this has been uh, interesting and so on, thought-provoking. If you have any comments, please write them beneath this video. Uh, stay tuned for part two and thank you for listening.